Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. We at one point flew out to Disney to meet with them. That was one thing they were very, very interested about is because they had these big, bulky, they even had for some collaboration sessions, they had big, bulky Cintiqs on carts. They had these specially built carts they would push around. And they're like, oh, whoa, can we just like carry around an iPad and like connect wirelessly? I was like, yeah. It was like blowing their minds at the time. Welcome back to another episode of Apple Pros. On this episode, I had the pleasure to speak with Matt Rungi who is the co-founder and CEO of Astropad. His company is the creator of Astropad and Luna Display, which are products that allow your iPad to become an invaluable tool for working on your Mac. Astropad is used in huge studios like Pixar and Nintendo. And besides chatting about the products they create, we also chat a bit about his background working at Apple, Garmin, on one of the very first iPad apps for aviation navigation and uh, his first company that focused on email. With that said, I just want to remind everyone that you can now financially support iPad Pros in two different places. First off, patreon.com slash iPad Pros. Get episodes early and with embedded MP3 chapter markers by supporting the podcast at any tier. Bonus content is also available at the higher tiers. You can also now subscribe to iPad Pros in Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcasts is an all-inclusive single subscription. You'll get all the bonus content plus episodes early by subscribing to the show in Apple Podcasts. By default, subscriptions are monthly, but if you go into your subscription settings in the settings app, you can switch it to a yearly plan. My thanks to everyone that currently or has in the past supported the podcast financially. This podcast is not a quick one to produce, and your support is greatly, greatly appreciated. You can also support the podcast for free simply by leaving a review in Apple Podcasts. No matter your region, it really does help. The reviews help send the right signals to Apple to show this podcast more in search, helping others discover the show. If you have a minute today, I'd really appreciate you opening up the podcast app and leaving a review. My thanks to everyone that has already done that. With that, here's my interview with Matt. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Matt. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to dive into everything you do with Astropad, uh, running that company. Yes. And uh, but before we get to that, I have a couple questions. Uh, first off, can you just broadly introduce yourself and what your current iPad setup is? Yeah, for sure. So, um, well, my name is Matt Rungi. I uh, live in uh, the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. And as you mentioned, I run Astropad. We're a bootstrapped uh, company. Uh, really built a lot of stuff around the the iPad ecosystem, actually, the iPad and the Mac ecosystem, which, of course, we're going to get into on this podcast. I'm a longtime Mac person, um, having been involved in even like the shareware scene in the 2000s, even before Mac OS X. Uh, so I've been a longtime Mac person, uh, developer, and engineer as well. And for my current iPad setup, I've got, I had to look up what generation it is, but it's a second, wait, no, third gen iPad Pro. Yep. So they went uh, when they went to Face ID. Yep, yep. And it's got a second gen uh, Apple Pencil. Nice. Which I yeah. love. I love the second gen Apple Pencil. It's um, it's the larger size, which is what? The 12, 12.9 inch. Uh, yep. That's right. iPad Pro. It's been great. I got that with the pencil. I've got the um, uh, keyboard on it as well, but don't use that as much. Okay. The, the original keyboard cover, you haven't uh, tried out the Magic uh, keyboard? No, I don't. I don't have a Magic the magic keyboard um the some people in the company do but i don't have one I've okay the, i just don't end up using the keyboard that much. yeah you use it um, more as an ipad and tablet with pencil and everything that's right pencil yeah. is definitely one of my preferred input methods on. yeah that's cool uh and then how do you personally use the ipad as i mentioned i'm a long time mac person so it's really hard to pull me away from my mac so day to day i still use my Mac for most stuff. And I yeah. use my iPad more as an accessory. Right. Which, as we'll talk about later, that's a lot of what your company does. It, it helps the <laughs> iPad be better, no. a better tool for, for the Mac. Yeah. Yeah. So not not, not a total shock there, right? That, yeah. That's how I use my my iPad. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, uh, I'll try to use my iPad more like full time for some of the stuff I'm doing. Uh, I've done it more for writing. Writing's I've, I've used my iPad, but I've never found the experience to be that, that great for me. I like to like put it on my lap and the keyboard just doesn't, doesn't work well. Yeah. Like the that. magic uh, keyboard is much better <laughs> in that, that kind it, of context. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And maybe I'll have to get one of those just to try that, just to have it kind of be more adjustable. Yeah. And having a trackpad is really um, something that kind of transforms it into a different experience as well, I believe. Yeah, you're convincing me actually now that maybe I do need to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I needed one, but... Um, and so, yeah, I use it a lot more as accessory. I love the pencil anytime I need to do any kind of drawing, sketching anything out, sketching out an idea, often to annotating stuff, yeah, uh, annotating screenshots. I find it just to be really natural to do with the pencil um, and reading stuff. Uh, if I've got a lot of documents or things to look at, I'll pull that up on the iPad. I just find that reading is actually a better experience on the iPad. So that really for me, it's just those areas that I find like typing and, and writing to be a better experience for me on my Mac. But those things like drawing input and reading is better on the iPad. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in college, I scanned in my textbooks uh, and uh, read them on the Mac and just, I, I wish I had an iPad back in those days. Cause yeah, that, iPad's that, that, amazing yeah. for that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. 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 So uh, before we get into AstroPad, I want to chat a bit about your background. Um, kind of, Way back in the day, you worked uh, yeah. at Apple on QuickTime and iPhoto, and uh, I saw on your LinkedIn um, the iPhoto photo uh, photo books or something you, mm-hmm. you helped uh, mm-hmm. were part of. Mm-hmm. I really miss those. I just I have to say, I'm not sure if there's much to chat about with the Apple stuff because I know there's a lot of NDA stuff. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, s- some because it was so long ago now. Yeah. Um. The uh, that's actually where I met my co-founder Giovanni. Um, so we were both, uh, Apple interns at the time. Um, and that, that's, that's how we met way back when still, uh, still in business together today. Um, uh, but I worked on iPhoto, as you mentioned, I also worked on QuickTime. Um, and yeah, I did work on the photo books, which I miss those things. Yeah. I wish you could super cool. Yeah. I wish you could order something from the iPad, uh, from the photos app, uh, kind of similar. Yeah. It was, it was super cool, super fun to work on that. Um, and I was also there at the time when they were working on the iPhone. So I didn't know they were working on it. I wasn't privy to that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, there was, uh, below where I was, was where they were sealed off working on the iPhone. And I knew they were working on some kind of embedded device because I had access to some of the code and it seemed uh, having to do with QuickTime. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this must be like a really fancy next gen iPad, iPod. Yeah. A um, big uh, iPod, <laughs> a little iPod video, you know? Yeah. yeah. Cause I could tell, yeah, I thought, you know, I was thinking more in the line of that. And then when they, then they revealed it, when uh, Steve Jobs revealed it, it was this incredible. I was like, oh, so that's what they're working on and why <laughs> nobody can go down there. Um, yeah. Cause I knew a number of people that were part of the project, but of course they couldn't tell me what they were. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, so it was it was fun. It was a it was a very very cool time to be at Apple. It was a great time to be there. Yeah, a lot of excitement, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you ever had many Steve interactions or not. No, not really. You'd see him in the hallway and stuff. You'd see him at lunch with uh, Johnny Ive. Yeah. Um, pretty much, yeah. Just passed him in the hallway. Um, and also when I was an intern, he would speak to the intern classes, so that was cool. Yeah. You could ask him questions and stuff, and that was always a lot of fun. Uh, but otherwise, you just see him buzzing around or talking to Scott Forstall, who was there at the time. Right. Yeah. I remember seeing them walking around the campus, walking around and around and around, really engrossed in whatever they were talking about. Yeah. So yeah, he did the walk and talks. So. <laughs> yep. 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 So uh, Garmin was a company you worked at, you know, after Apple. And this yes. was back when the iPad was brand new, 2010 to 2012. And I remember pretty vividly back then, one of the reasons um, I really wanted the 3G version of the iPad was you also got the GPS radios with it. And that meant uh, back in those days, there was a very um, thriving like GPS market, because this was back when like Apple Maps wasn't really good at turn by turn, or I'm not sure. Yep. It didn't even have it, probably. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I don't think it had. I don't think it had that yet. Yeah, so I used my iPad as my turn by turn device, the TomTom, because it had great battery life. And uh, so around this time, uh, early iPad days, you were working on the aviation um, part of you know navigation with an iPad, and this is still a big scene with you know the iPad Mini was shown off recently as that. Uh, What are your recollections back from this early days of iPad? Yeah, so that was really cool to work on the aviation stuff because coming into it, I didn't know anything about aviation, uh, but pretty quickly had to learn a lot about it, which was which was tons of fun. And there were really two main, there's still even to this day, there's two main competitors in the space, Garmin Pilot and Forflight. Yeah. Um, And Forflight was like a startup that they did really, really well. I think they were eventually sold to Boeing for a ton of money. Um, And... 
they were really the first in the space. And then Garmin also decided to get into the space as well. And so I was the first engineer working on this. Uh, do we call it Garmin Pilot yet? It was like um, MyCast because MyCast Pilot, I can't remember the exact name anyway. But so we started working on this, try to figure out what we could do with the iPad in aviation. Um, and it was uh, it was really pretty interesting and really pretty powerful. And so much so that Almost always, if you see pictures of cockpit cockpits today, mm-hmm. helicopters, all sorts of planes, commercial, private, you name it, they probably have an iPad in them. Yeah, like it's extremely common. It's such a versatile tool um, for it, and so we um, we had to kind of nobody was really quite sure what to do with the iPad UI at the time either, like how to how to build it. Is it just a big iPhone or is it something different? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like, how do we make this work for avi- aviation? So there's a lot of cool like UI design stuff we had to figure out there. Another thing is being able to quickly slurp down a bunch of data to be able to take it up in the sky. Cause you're not going to get 3g access no. when you're, you know, <laughs> yeah. thousands of feet up, right? right? It's just not happening. So we had to build um, some pretty sophisticated systems for downloading map data. So you could have all sorts of offline map data. You could have radar data. You could have different kinds of weather data. And then we had to have a way to expire it and store it. So, you know, like if it's right, so you could pretty much right before your plane take, off, you could slurp down all the data you need for the flight, and we would tailor the data we would save to the iPad depending on your flight path. Hmm. Um, yeah. And so that was that was pretty neat. There was all sorts of cool stuff we could do with um, rerouting flight paths by using the touch interface, which had really never been done before. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, and also just being able to uh, pull up things like PDFs. So they um, have these things called approach plates, which it's for landing and you're in IFR conditions, which it's IFR is when you're flying by instruments because um, the weather's bad. I was going to ask about that because like with driving in a car, you're actually using your visual acuity of what the road looks like in front yep. of you. But when you're flying, a lot of times you should be able to fly completely blind almost. Yep. If you're an IFR certified pilot, yeah, definitely. And so we would have things like these approach plates that were PDFs and then we could pull up and then we could, we could plot, um, your location on this PDF to show like, what's the flight path you should fly to come down. So really, really cool stuff. And this was stuff that previously was limited to very expensive equipment made by Garmin that would be put in your cockpit, or they had these um, handheld devices you could use, but they had tiny screens. They were super cumbersome to use, and they were like bricks. Yeah. Um, and so, like the iPad was just a total game changer here, and that's also why Garmin wanted to see what they could do with the iPad because they realized that you know this could replace the need for a lot of their existing existing portable devices that they had. Right. Yeah. And it would open the market to kind of lower end pilots that are just you know, beginner. Yeah. Who before couldn't have access to any of this kind of stuff. Really. Right. It was yeah. like for the super high end and yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to work in, uh, the aviation stuff. I do have to say just cause there was so much with the, that I didn't know about it. Yeah, for sure. So after, after Garmin, you moved on to creating a company that dealt with email. Uh, mail core was an open source email application or I guess still is. Um, um, and it was kind of the foundation of a lot of apps, including Airmail, uh, the email app for the Pebble smartwatch. I had mm-hmm. one of those back in the day. And um, what were some of the big challenges with email? And I guess still, there are still challenges with email. And um, kind of what do you think of the current landscape? And um, it seems to be a hard space to really crack and nail perfect. There's a lot of uh, details to get right here. Yeah, it's a really hard space. Um, and I would note <laughs> the fact that I have uh, a lot of experience with email, yet, uh, my company doesn't do anything with it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> like, it's very hard. <laughs> Having been in it, I know how hard of a space it is to crack, especially with uh, things like Gmail out there. It makes it very hard to compete. So uh, MailCore was actually an open source thing I've been doing a long time. Even, uh, it's originally started on the Mac. I wanted to build a Mac email client. And I found that working with the email protocols was extremely cumbersome and difficult. And so the first step was I wanted to build a library to kind of wrap this up and make it easier so that then you could build a nice user interface on top of. I never got on to the part of building the actual email app, but I did build the framework that you could build an email app 
out of yeah. uh, for the Mac. And so this kind of lay dormant for a while because before the iPhone, just nobody was really doing Objective-C. Nobody, there wasn't much co- much in the way of Cocoa programmers out there. It was a pretty obscure thing. But then when the iPhone came out and the SDKs became available, all of a sudden there was a lot more interest in being able to do email type stuff on for the iPhone, you know, with the Objective C type framework. So that's where MailCore picked up a lot of uh, steam and became a lot more popular. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, it's been used in a wide variety of email apps. It's still out there today. There's there's a newer version, MailCore 2, that's out there. I don't work on it or maintain it anymore. There's other folks that do these days. Um, but uh, we did some email, some consulting as well, where we helped companies develop email apps uh, around MailCore. And that was actually really what we were doing prior to Astropad itself, my co-founder and I. Uh, but as you mentioned, email is an incredibly tough space to to work in it's it's the thing so there's there's two things um about there's a couple things about email one is you're rather limited by the protocols that are out there as imap and smtp yeah so if you want to do like super innovative stuff um even stuff that seems pretty commonplace now but totally wasn't years ago like snooze for example in gmail that requires server-side support that kind of stuff you can't easily do with the built-in protocols. You're you're rather limited. Even quickly syncing and downloading an email mailbox can be quite slow, and you're just limited with the the IMAP protocol itself. So if you want something to be super fast, uh, you really need your own server, and then you really need to do your own protocol. And that's what Gmail does with their Gmail app. Fastmail, I also use Fastmail. Fastmail has their own protocol they're working on because you're just too limited. And that's a really big task, right? It is, yeah. The the security and the infrastructure needed to run an email setup is significant. So that puts it out of the hands of a lot of smaller developers. The, um, The other thing is everybody has their own pet features in email. Right. What's not important to me is super important to you and vice versa. So you end up with... Speaking of aviation, something that looks like a 747 <laughs> cockpit, you need to have just all sorts of options and configurations and buttons and way, different workflows because everybody's got a slightly different workflow. And that's why so many people aren't satisfied with apps out there because their workflow is just off, just a, just enough to not Yeah, they fit. want parts of one app, parts of another. And exactly. Smash, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so it's really hard to get that perfect fit. Um and there's tons of free email stuff out there, too. So even if you can make this super complex, uh, sophisticated, really powerful email tool, it can be pretty hard to compete when Gmail is getting better all the time and it's free. And if it needs to be server-side, uh, migration cost is a lot. People don't want to change their email address. Typically. Absolutely, yeah. There's, yeah. there's, um, And there's still... Um, there's still folks doing some really cool stuff in the um, in the space. Mimestream, I think it's yeah, Mimestream. Yeah, make sure I got the name right. It's a really cool email app out there. Um, that one's Gmail only as of right now, but really powerful, really cool. But again, they're able to do more because they're limiting themselves just to Gmail. You know, uh, hey, the 37 signals. Well, I guess they don't call themselves that anymore. Basecamp. Yeah. With the hey uh, email, you know, that's interesting as well. They've really um, have a very opinionated view of email, I would say. Mm-hmm. But maybe that appeals to some people. So you really need to do something like that. It's really hard to compete in the general purpose email um, space today. So that's that's a big reason why we haven't gotten into it, despite significant background in it yeah no it makes sense so let's move on astropad so your company has been around quite a long time at this point uh it launched when the ipad was at the ipad fourth generation and you had the original ipad mini a couple months later you'd have the ipad air and the second gen ipad mini launched uh so that's kind of time frame when your company kind of came out uh with astropad originally Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the iPad landscape, hardware-wise, has evolved quite a bit since then. We have an Apple Pencil. That's uh, asked, It blows my mind that AstroPad launched when the Apple Pencil wasn't even <laughs> around. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild, yeah. So, yeah, how's the evolution of the iPad hardware kind of informed what, you, what your company believes it can provide for people? As a, as a yeah, offering. so the um, you really nailed it with the iPad Pencil. The iPad Pencil is or the Apple Pencil, not iPad Pencil. Yeah. Apple Pencil 
is really key. Um, we did come out before that. We supported third party, third party styluses. They weren't that great, but our bet at the time was that a stylus on the iPad just made too much sense. So either a third party was really going to nail it and they were going to do an amazing stylus or uh, Apple was going to make their own stylus. That was our bet. Yeah. And there was some, you know, there was third party styluses that were good enough. There was one by Adonit we liked in particular that we used. Um, but we were making a long term bet and we were pretty lucky there that soon after Apple introduced the um, Apple Pencil. And the Apple Pencil is still the most interesting uh, iPad hardware to me, uh, period. Yeah. It's, it's just, I still think there's so much untapped potential with the Apple Pencil. Like, I still feel like the hardware is ahead of the software. Hmm. Like we haven't quite figured out what to do with the Apple Pencil. Uh, I still think, like, Scribble is really interesting. There's a lot of different things that uh, on the, um, the new thing for doing a quick note on the iPad. There's a lot of interesting experiments, but I don't think we've quite, uh, quite nailed it. And I think it's going to be ever more interesting as the pencil gets even better. I think they're going to reduce the latency. They're going to make it feel even more realistic. And as as the latency reduces and the iPad gets lighter and thinner, it's going to feel ever more like a piece of paper that you're drawing on. And so that's going to get better. And things like uh, optical character recognition and being able to you know just write something out, it quickly turns into text. While that's in there right now, it's still not great, but that mm-hmm. is going to get better over time. I mean, you see all the amazing advancements happening in AI stuff in general right now. In machine. Yeah, learning. the live text thing just blows my mind pretty much every time. Yeah, live text. Yeah, live text is a great example of like how much better that stuff is getting. So I think a lot of the Apple Pencil is still untapped. Like what, what would like a next generation... Um, uh, word processor look like built around the Apple Pencil, where you're not using a keyboard, you're using a pencil. Like the just the yeah. interactions and how you would work with it would be would be totally different. So uh, that's I'm still I'm still excited to see to see where that goes. Um, and the, the <laughs> Apple Pencil too is really what made our company yeah. as well. So uh, you know, obviously another reason I like it yeah, as well. Yeah, the, the improvements in that second gen were substantial. Like it went from something that was probably dead half the time to something that's just always ready. Yeah, yeah, and right, right in a great, great spot, right on on top of the iPad. Um, versus like the keyboard stuff, I, I still feel like the keyboard stuff they haven't figured. Out. But then again, maybe I just need a magic keyboard. That's what yeah. I'm missing. Yeah, but yeah, Apple Pencil, I love it. Yeah, I. In high school and college, she used fountain pens all the time because that was my only entertainment as I was in class, uh, doodling away with those things. And the pencil really does a great job in letting me be as expressive as a fountain pen. Um, I just wish there was some way to have some kind of resistance. I know in glass, it's going to be hard to figure that aspect out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know, I think Microsoft's been experimenting with some, some stuff yeah, uh, with recently like haptics, with their latest yeah, yeah. haptics on the service pen. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Or if Apple does decide to introduce some kind of texture to the iPad as well, that could be yeah interesting. I don't know if they'd ever do that because it'd probably interfere with um, it, the touch experience, and it might actually wear off over time. Probably yeah. Well, and then um, with the third party ones I have used, like the colors and the the display is just not as vivid. You oh put yeah, something on it, it's just not. Do it. Yeah, it's yep. just not not quite the same. Yeah, and they're. Yeah, the screens, they just keep getting better and they don't want to do anything to impair that. Yeah, yeah. And they're obviously investing a ton in the screens, so they definitely don't want to make them look worse. Yeah. So where'd the name AstroPad come from? Yeah, so it was actually a code name. Uh, it started out as a code name because we wanted to do the iPad as a drawing tablet. Mm-hmm. And we just needed a name for this project. And our the company we had founded, we were doing the email stuff at the time, was Astro HQ. That was that was the name of the company. And so we were like, oh, well, it's the iPad and it's done by Astro. So uh, yeah, AstroPad, why not? And that was the code name. And it stuck. It just totally <laughs> stuck. We tell people our code name. They'd be like, oh, that's a great name. And be like, really? You think so? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, I love the name. So we're like, okay, I guess, I guess we're going to keep it. So much so now that um, actually the company itself goes by AstroPad these days. Yeah. Um, we don't even go by uh, AstroHQ. Technically, technically, our legal name is AstroHQ. Right. Uh, but 
you know, we do business as Astropad. And uh, Luna display, Luna also being a space term. So that makes sense. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Coming out of, uh, we wanted something to uh, distinguish it from Astropad. Uh, and so we wanted a different a different name so people knew that it wasn't just an accessory to Astropad. Right. Yeah. So uh, the introduction of the Apple Pencil was huge for your company. Was the Pencil the thing that enabled the product to get inside the doors of like Nintendo and Disney and some of these huge studios to take this product seriously? Is that what, what did it? The Apple Pencil was huge for us, and it was definitely how we got in the doors there. We did show a prototype of a th- Astropad with a third-party stylus to somebody at Pixar, and they thought that was super cool. Uh, it made for an awesome demo, but not something that they could ne- necessarily use day in and day out. The accuracy... On um, both pressure and precision was just mm-hmm. not there. Yeah. So it didn't become truly professional level until until the Apple Pencil. Gotcha. Yeah. And at this time, you're competing against w- Wacom tablets yep. primarily. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. That's really what we wanted to replace. Right. Because that experience, do they have screens in them as well? Because I've only used ones where you're you're writing in the the tablet and having to look at the computer screen and trying to translate that properly. Yeah, totally. And that's what I had used prior as well. Actually, both my co-founder and I had used were those kind of old fashioned graphics tablets you're talking about, like the black slate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I had, I had used those, uh, and been quite frustrated with them. Uh, it was a very, it's like a relearning how to use them. And Wacom has had for a long time, they call it their Cintiq, uh, line of products where it was a screen integrated with okay. the stylus as well. Yeah. The reason you never heard about them <laughs> is they were super expensive. Okay. So people at Pixar and Disney had them. Right. Uh, and at, you know, super high, super high end artists had them, but otherwise they were just way outside. Unless you were a super pro, they're way outside your budget. I mean, they were thousands and thousands. Uh, when we first, I haven't looked at the prices recently. They've come down because of competition from the iPad and other other areas. But when we first got started with uh, Astropad, those things would cost you three thousand dollars to get to get one of those to draw on. So it was just way just not affordable. You could get a mod book for that amount. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could. It was it was insane. And if you looked at like the total cost of like having to get a MacBook Pro, having to get a uh, one of these Cintiqs and and the accessories to go with it, it just really added up quickly. Yeah. It was just not not reasonable. There's and, also and some, the Cintiq acted as like an external monitor would mirror the display. Or okay, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, it you could do it either way. You could do a mirror, or you could do external display gotcha. with the Cintiq. And, you can drag and still. To it. Yeah. yeah, and still people totally use the Cintiqs today, but and they've had to be more competitive. But uh, we thought we could way undercut it with the iPad. We could do what they were doing with the iPad, and we could do cool stuff that they couldn't do. Like we could be wireless, right? And we could be because these Cintiqs are extru- they were. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Again, I haven't seen one recently. Extremely heavy. These big bulky screens you'd put on your desk. Not something you're going to put in your lap to draw. Not something you're going to take home to work later. At. So we thought the iPad added a lot of flexibility on top of just I mean, way cheaper. Yeah, with the wireless, I imagine collaboration might be a much more fluid thing where you're at your desk drawing something out. You go over to your next door um, office and show them some sketch something out together. Absolutely. And that's something um, we at one point flew out to Disney to meet with them. That was one thing they were very, very interested about is because they had these big, bulky, they even had for some collaboration sessions, they had big, bulky Cintiqs on carts. They had these specially built carts they would push around. And they're like, oh, whoa, can we just like carry around an iPad and like connect wirelessly? I was like, yeah. It was like blowing their minds at the time. Yeah, that's cool. Graphics tablets like this, uh, did you personally have much use of them? Like, what, what's your background with, with this kind of tech? Yeah, well, I was a hobbyist at best. Um, actually, and my uh, my co-founder as well, Giovanni, he had also dabbled with it. And we just messed around with Photoshop and other tools with it. Uh, nothing like, at least for myself, nothing seriously, truly professional. Okay. And neither of you worked in the Inkwell part of the Mac OS back in the day, I'm guessing. No, uh-uh, no. Um, it didn't, didn't work on that part. Uh, we had really used 
the traditional drawing tablets enough to know how frustrating they were. Right. We had never gotten them to work well for ourselves. So we're like, we're, we can't be the only people like this. What have been some of the more kind of interesting setups you've seen from Astropad users? Um, like any notable things that jump out with, without any accessories or using the help their iPad be more ergonomic and for drawing? Yeah. Um, in terms of like physical accessories, hmm, <laughs> not sure offhand anything comes to mind there. Uh, one of, one of the uh, wildest um, examples I've seen of it is there's a group that uses it on archaeological dig sites and they have like a Mac set up with a Wi-Fi network and yeah. then they have um they're also wandering around tracing stuff with um the uh with Astropad. They're running mm-hmm. Astropad on it, using it to restore these these pictures of really these ancient dig sites. Um, I'll have to find it. There's a blog post on it on our website because we we came across it by accident. Somebody emailed into our customer support about it and we were like, this is insane. <laughs> can, we, can we talk to you more about what you're doing? Um, we didn't really think we'd have archaeologists using this, but yeah. sure enough, uh, we do. And that's been super cool. For the Wi-Fi range, is it as long as your iPad has a strong Wi-Fi connection to the same Wi-Fi network your Mac does, you're good to that's go? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if you have a really powerful Wi-Fi network, um, you know, mesh network, you yeah. can really go a long ways. That's cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there was any kind of range thing where it had to be within a couple rooms <laughs> nope. or something. Nope, nope. Really dependent more on your Wi-Fi network. I'm curious about Nintendo. How how'd you find out about Nintendo? Did they reach out to you or is it um, how did that come about? Yeah, so that's been more, uh, more through them reaching out to us, yeah. interested in asking about a feature or interested in buying a bunch of licenses and unfortunately we don't know too much about their their workflows and setups um i know pixar for example a lot of their folks like to have multiple setups so they might have a cintiq in their office that they use but then they want to dabble on some stuff at night and they would bring their macbook pro home and bring astropad on their iPad and use that to, to dabble on the go. Okay. Um, yeah. That, that's been a big, um, a big selling point uh, with that. It's just the flexibility of being able to take it with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Versus like the Cintiq. There's just no way, <laughs> <laughs> no way you're, you're going to do it. Um, and so it's really been more of them, them reaching out to us, asking questions and, you know, pushing for a certain feature. Yeah. Have there been features you've implemented because some of the big studios have been, been looking for it? Definitely stuff that's been from the feedback f- features we've done um, based on, well, one was from an artist from Pixar that wanted these quick keys, we call them in Astropad. Mm-hmm. And it's a way to quickly toggle like the option key. So when, when he's drawing, he wants to be able to t- toggle things like shift, option. Um, I think option was for like selecting colors. He was using that for selecting colors and, and photos. Photoshop. So we introduced that. That was actually there since our first 1.0. And that was specifically a feature we we put there. We would never have thought of it ourselves. But watching yeah. him work, uh, we we put it in there because we're like, this is this is pretty key to his workflow. So we actually absolutely do take those things into account. As far as what you see on the iPad while using AstroPad, is it a full mirror of your Mac or is it some kind of do you custom write things for certain apps that are used most often with Astropad to be different or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. It's It really is what you see. There is really a mirror of your Mac and Astropad. Uh, but then we've, we have a sidebar that we have that you can pull up where we've put a lot of common functions to make them a little easier because they're like native native UI in a sidebar on the iPad that we have that you can pull out versus on the Mac and be even with the pencil. It's some of the UI is much more, you can interact with it with the pencil, but your fingers just way too big. Yeah. Still, despite that for speed reasons, we'll put stuff in the sidebar so you can quickly access it. So one thing, for example, is you can access all the running applications. There is a way in the sidebar, you touch the current app icon and it'll bring up a list of all running apps. And we actually pull that from the dock a list of it, and then show all the icons. You can quickly switch. So sometimes people want to go from Illustrator to Photoshop, and you can you can do that easily. So we're trying to make some of that s- kind of blend the two, and we'd like to do more of that in the future too with 
uh, Astrobet Studio, introducing more ways to customize your customize your workspace to make it easier to do the actions you frequently do. Like we want to make the things, we want to make everything you can do on your Mac possible. So if there's some obscure menu item you want to go to and pull up some obscure dialogue in Photoshop, you can do it. You can totally do it because we're just mirroring your Mac. Yeah. But things that you do more often, like, say, changing colors or zooming in and out or switching to an eraser, those things we want to make build into a certain way native into our iPad interface so we can make it smoother and faster. Nice. Yeah. And then there's this whole gesture um, language yes, you've developed. Yes. As you mentioned, a lot of people will just have the pencil and the iPad and the Mac is a complicated OS in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we created uh, for Astrobed Studio. So we introduced a new version of, uh, this was in 2017, so it was a while ago. We introduced like a more professional version of Astropad we called Astropad Studio. And as part of that, we introduced Magic Gestures, which was a way, which is still in there today. It's a way to modify what happens when the pencil touches the screen. We were really proud of it because we didn't see other people doing this kind of stuff at the time. But to get an idea how it works is, so let's say you're in Photoshop. You draw with the pencil. So you just put the pencil on the screen and it starts to draw. Now, okay, now what if you want to switch to an eraser temporarily? Well, what you can do then with magic gestures is you can put one finger down. And so then we text the finger using the, you know, the touch the touch screen on the iPad, we detect that there's a finger down. And that indicates to us that we need to change what the pencil's doing. So now if you use the pencil, it'll work like an eraser. Or you could do two fingers and you touch on the screen and that indicates to us that it should be a right click. So we can do different things like this. And it's also totally customizable as well. So you can change what actions you want to happen. So we have some people uh, that do 3D stuff and they have it where one of the f- gestures, so they'll do like maybe a two finger gesture plus the pencil does the middle mouse button, which is a frequently used thing for people doing um, 3d work where they're, they're moving around their workspace doing that. So that opens up a lot more workspace possibilities than we can build in ourselves to make it customizable yeah. like that. And uh, we thought it was a really cool way to customize, uh, to very quickly be able to change what the uh, what the pencil does when it touches the screen. Has any of that stuff made its way to Luna Display when you're in kind of the headless mode of the Mac? No, Luna Display is much simpler. Okay. Um, some stuff has made it. I'm trying to remember which of the... It doesn't have magic gestures, though. It okay. doesn't have the complete... Uh, suite of magic gestures we do have some stuff i'm trying to remember if tap to undo is in there or not uh we definitely have you know your typical pinch and pan gestures but a lot of the more advanced stuff is in astrobed studio only okay because while it is super powerful it's also pretty complicated yeah so we've really streamlined uh luna and what you can do with Luna as well is if so for those that don't know Luna Display it's a it's a hardware dongle really that you can plug into your Mac and allows you to use the iPad as a second display or actually now we support another Mac as well as a second display. Yeah. Um, we also I should mention we work on PC now as well so you can plug a Luna into a PC to use an iPad as a as a second display or coming very soon to be able to use a PC with an iMac display. That's pretty cool. Oh, very neat. Yeah, no, yeah. No, we, so don't, that's, we don't have target display mode anymore. So this absolutely, is just, yeah. So it. we've we've got our way to do it with Luna. So it's really flexible for doing second displays, but we've really focused around that. Um, Astropad is a lot more the advanced like drawing functionality, and the cool thing is you compare the two together. So if you're running Astropad Studio and you plug in Luna, it'll detect it and it'll work together. And does the added hardware make Astropad that much better, or how's? Yeah. So then what happens is Astropad will act as a full second display. So now you're going to get second display. And you're going to get all the functionality that Astropad Studio offers. So you're going to get the magic gestures, all the sidebar, everything we have in uh, Astropad. Because Astropad by itself only mirrors. Mm -hmm. But if you plug in Luna, it'll act as a second display as well. Okay, so the Astropad app itself will expand out to include Luna display functionality. That's right. That's right. So the... The Luna, the Luna app um, itself will just really extend your display, um, but if you pair it with Astrobed Studio, that's where it gets a lot more powerful. That's yeah. where you're able to access all the Astrobed Studio features. So um, Luna Display is hardware based. Uh, how graceful is the transition? If you're an Astropad person, uh, if you're outside of the hardware range, 
is it pretty good at graciously falling back to the Wi-Fi for AstroPad, or um, how does that work? Yeah, so with um, with Luna, it still uses the your main Wi-Fi. Okay. So you still get the same range of whatever your uh, your Wi-Fi router is. So you'll really get the same uh, same experience with AstroPad as AstroPad, where it's whatever your mm-hmm. Wi-Fi range is. Okay, gotcha. The dongle is mainly talent because it's on the mac or windows or whatever that's right it's acting like you plug an hdmi uh dongle into the pc version and it's like oh this is my hdmi port so it's that's, that's right the aspect of it and okay and then you're telling the dongle yep to use that and then it says oh there's a yeah, it says oh there's a display here and then we can configure it to match the ipad gotcha yeah so um with astropad i'm not sure how many people would use an external keyboard on the ipad when they're using astropad but um what is that experience like when you hit like command space with an iPad attached keyboard? Is it uh, talking to the iPad OS and searching or the Mac or both or how's, how's that? Experience? Yeah. So that's, that's one area I wish we had more control as app developers because there's a bunch of the, there's a bunch of the stuff on there that, um, and I believe command space is one of them that we actually don't even see that key command. Like the system intercepts it before we even see it. Right. Yeah. So we're more limited in that, like, yeah, now you can't. If you want to do that on your Mac and connected through Luna Display, you can't because we we never get that key press. There's a couple other things, too. I'm trying to remember, like, the I think the globe, uh, we can't intercept. Um, but typically, f- uh, keyboard shortcuts would work on the Mac. Um, it's just, yeah. It, it's the system-wide stuff that it kind of overrides it. it it's, with. it's the iPad OS system wide stuff that we can't override. Um, now it may be, I don't know if there's a way in the preferences to change that on iPad OS. I don't think so. I think you'd have to change what Spotlight is on your Mac to like a different keyboard shortcut. So. Yeah. And that's what we've suggested to people that really, really want to do that. That hasn't been a big complaint. Outside of those few exceptions, everything else just works. Yeah. We, when you press a key, on your iPad, we send key up and key down commands just like a physical keyboard to your Mac. So as far as your Mac's concerned, there's a physical keyboard there. Okay. Um, and it's really just on the iPad side that um, there's a few things we can't intercept. And the Apple Pencil, is, are you guys doing anything with the double tap uh, gesture in that? No, we don't do anything with the double tap gesture right now. You know, and it hasn't been a big request. It's honestly kind of cumbersome to use. Yeah, it's uh, um, sometimes hard to get right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we we played with it a little bit, um, but at the time we opted not to do anything with it because we were just like, well, we're not really sure what to do with this. Yeah. And then we're like, well, let's wait to see what what customers say. And uh, it'd be we interesting just if heard you that had, much about it. It'd be interesting if you had tied to a keyboard shortcut for the Mac. Um, I use the yeah, double could, tap for podcast editing within Ferrite, and I have it tied to like select all the following after this playhead kind of thing. Mm, uh, yeah, so. that could be that could be pretty interesting to do like a select all. We could totally do that. Yeah. We could make that convertible. I mean, maybe that's something we should do in the future. And I don't know, maybe after this we'll get a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of feature requests. Tell us what you want to do with the double tap. Um, we're we're just not, yeah. not really sure because. Uh, we, I find that the magic gesture we have for the eraser to be much faster than the double tap. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the standard version doesn't have the gestures. What is kind That's of the, right. the baseline version? This is the app that you can just buy standalone versus the studio, which is for professionals. That's the subscription model. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So the, the whole lineup is AstroPad standard, which is really our introductory, like our hobbyist basic version of AstroPad for doing a drawing tablet. And we have AstroPad Studio, which is like our flagship that's got all the features and um, really meant for professional artists. And then um, Luna Display, which can be coupled, which is the hardware we mentioned, which can be coupled with either the either version of AstroPad or used by itself and allows you to add that extra display support. Um, and standard is really what we started with and it's still, uh, much more basic in terms of functionality. It doesn't have the gestures. It doesn't have custom pressure curves. It doesn't have, um, uh, it has limitations in our sidebar menu, what you can do with it. Uh, you can't, for example, um, have per app shortcuts, right? You, there's like one shortcut you set for the whole, yeah. St- for for everything versus in studio we detect what's frontmost and we'll we'll swap in different shortcut sets uh, so there's a number of different configuration options like that 
that if you're just doing some whiteboarding and uh, you might not care that much. Right. And that's where right. spread standard comes in. You're like, Oh, I just some very occasional light annotation. Uh, maybe I want to annotate a PDF. Maybe I want to pull up a whiteboard and zoom and I want to annotate that way. Right. Like, Asperger's Standard is great for that. But if you're somebody where you're working in Photoshop and you want every time-saving gesture and, and shortcut you can get, that's where Asperger's Studio comes in. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I noticed uh, for the standard, um, you're showcasing kind of Zoom and using Astropad with that. Um, yes, yes. Is that yep. just built into Zoom or is that something... You guys kind of yeah, there is. Um, let me see what's. I'm trying to remember what we have on that that web page here. Pull that up. Uh, there is a whiteboarding feature built into Zoom. I don't remember. I think that is the uh, that picture we have there. I think that is the. Yep, that is. There's a uh, there's a whiteboard uh, whiteboard feature built right into Zoom. Okay. It's pretty limited, but that's right. actually what we're showing in the screenshot there. Gotcha. And yeah. that's and that's the kind of thing that yeah, Astropad Astropad Standard is really good for. Nice. Yeah. And Scribble. I'm guessing uh, you'd have no way of supporting this because it's looking for iPad text boxes and you're looking at a Mac screen. Is that is that right? Yeah, we don't have any support for Scribble right now. Um, that's not to say that we can't ever. We really should take a fresh look at the APIs and see what we can do with them. Yeah. Because I do think that'd be super cool. Right. If you can, if you can <laughs> totally. use Scribble and it would go to your Mac. I never say never, but we don't have it in there right now. Yeah, I think it'd be it. A hard thing to solve, but maybe there are APIs to allow that. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to look at what they have right now. Yeah. At the time, it wasn't super easy to do. Yeah. So anything about Astropad we haven't covered before we move on to Luna? No, I think we I think we just about hit it. Okay, cool. So a Luna display, as we've mentioned before, hardware mm-hmm. device allows you to use your iPad as a second monitor as well as some other devices, uh, secondary, monitor, secondary monitor kind of product. Um how is this approach different from solutions to this problem like VNC, Sidecar, or even I think um, um, the other day we had to use an Apple TV 4K because we our HDMI adapter for the Mac was broken. So that worked <laughs> in a pinch. You can now AirPlay to a Apple TV as a, another mm-hmm. monitor. How is mm-hmm. uh, Luna uh, different or, uh, for this approach? Yeah, Luna definitely takes a different approach where we use physical hardware to do it, where you can plug it in to the the Mac versus a lot of these others are pure software, which have advantages and disadvantages. Um, side, so VNC, uh, you're more limited. And in fact, often you'll see people use like little HDMI dongles and things that they'll plug into. Yeah. a Like a Mac mini that they're VNC into. So VNC really has the same problem. And that's why we also introduced a... Uh, hardware device too, so we can really create yeah. a monitor. It's I'm like a recalling monitor. back. I actually, I forgot I did this. I had a Mac back to like 2006 or so, a Mac Mini, and I wanted to use it headless with an iPad. And I did the thing you're you're saying. I had yep. this like fake HDMI thing that pretended to the Mac OS that it was actually hooked up to a monitor. So, yeah, so yeah. that can be a that can be a pretty common thing. Um, and that's the really the approach we've taken with Luna is because we can provide a, as far as your Mac, when you plug in a Luna and when it gets turned on, as far as your Mac knows, that's a real screen there. I know we know it's not because we see, you know, we see that it's, it's the small red device, right? But it's acting like a screen. Yeah. So anything you can do, anything the Mac does with a with a full display, you can do with Luna. And so that's really powerful in that it doesn't know it's any different than a typical screen you plug in. That's the approach we took with Luna. There is um, some software stuff out there even before we did Luna. That had the problem of using kernel extensions and other things that were not always that reliable. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a long time, they didn't support graphics acceleration. And given our base of creative professionals using things like uh, Adobe Photoshop, that was a no-go for us. We're like, we absolutely have to have graphic acceleration. Uh, and then Apple's also with Sidecar. They have their own way of doing things. They have their own internal API to do that. Yeah. So they're doing, and that's actually how um, the Apple TV stuff works as well. Mm-hmm. We don't actually know what they're doing for that, <laughs> but they're able to like virtualize a, a display. Um, and it's all private stuff that we yeah. don't have access to. We can't do it, which isn't surprising though, because Apple owns the whole stack. I mean, they own it now, even down to the processor. So <laughs> they can they can do uh, they can do whatever they want with that. Um, but that's not something we we have access to. 
The other thing is by being a hardware device, we're also cross-platform. And so we can work on Windows. We can work on Mac now. Doesn't matter. You can you, you can buy a USB-C to Luna and you can alternate using it between your Mac and, and your PC. Um, and that's just because it shows up as a generic display. So that's really, really powerful. You have to do the one-time configuration on first Windows and then Mac or vice versa? Yeah. When you first get it, there's like a firmware update process that yeah. has to run. But beyond that, you're you're good to go. You can swap. When you're doing that, are you telling the Luna stick and writing something to the Luna to say, here's the Wi-Fi you should be connecting to, even if you're not in the OS yet? Or what's the configuration kind of look like? Yeah. So when you start up, uh, the so you'll need to start up a Luna app on whatever it is you want to be a display, be it another Mac or an iPad. So you start the Luna app there. And then you start the Luna app on Windows or on Mac. And when that Luna app is started, that's when it talks to the attached Luna hardware. So um, it'll establish a connection and configure it at that point and tell, hey, monitor, turn on. Yeah. And after you do this one-time uh, connection, say you're in the middle of nowhere with your laptop, uh, does it need to be on that original Wi-Fi connection or does it know locally uh, if you're kind of nearby to, to talk? Um, no, you'll need to, you'll need something to establish the connection. So in that case, you could do a physical connection like a USB or if it's computer to computer, you could mm-hmm. do Thunderbolt or okay. Ethernet or do like a um, uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi network would work yep. as well. Okay. And then the iPad has Apple Pencil and things like that. Um but with Luna Display, it's primarily just acting as a kind of secondary monitor. Uh, any unique kind of things you're taking advantage of because it's an iPad? Well, the the touch stuff for sure. Okay. Um, yeah. And that was, uh, I mean, I know we do that in um, in AstroPad, but there's something special about the aspect ratio of the Mac display matching exactly the iPad and it being retina resolution and then being able to do touch gestures on the Mac yeah. is pretty weird. Yeah, I it's remember cool. trying to do that over different setups and making a four by three thing look good. It was always a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh but when we can match it exactly, that's like all of a sudden it really feels like you have Mac OS on your iPad. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of our woe feeling when we were officially uh, originally building it. Because originally Luna was just going to be an accessory for AstroPad. Mm-hmm. It was never going to be its own product originally. Um, and it was when we saw like it really working on the iPad, we're like, this is super cool. Like this is useful for people other than just artists. This is really, really cool. <laughs> and so that touch stuff is um is really powerful. Uh even on the PC now, we have people people doing that and what's interesting is because the pc it's windows windows 10 and 11 natively support touch they support you know pinch and pan but not everybody's pc yeah and a stylus but not everybody's pc supports those things and the other thing is the er well apple's been spout you know been saying this for a long time but the ergonomics are really weird yeah to touch a laptop screen like i have multiple test pcs here in my office that have touch screens I never touch the screen. Like I did it initially, but then it's just, it's, pr- it's a pretty weird thing to do. It's not yeah. very natural. Imagine Versus, scrolling might be the only thing you might occasionally want to do. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even that it's just, just as easy to touch the touchpad and scroll right. the touchpad. Yeah. I don't know if that's just because I've been a computer user for far too long and I'm stuck in my ways and my habits. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's still ergonomically, the iPad is just better for touch. And so we have people doing touch stuff on um, Windows uh, Windows 11 or Windows 10, and they're doing it through their iPad. That's cool. And that's pretty cool. That's that's what, you know, really like, okay, this isn't just another screen. This is yeah. really an iPad. On Windows, does the, I guess they call it the pen over there, does the Apple Pencil act as a pen or how does that, that work? Yep. Yep, we've built in complete support for that, um, where it'll it'll act like a stylus. In some ways, it was actually easier to build for Windows because these things are natively supported on on Windows versus Mac OS. We kind of had to simulate it, I would say. Yeah. Like the Mac itself doesn't have touch. So if you want to scroll, that's where we like, oh, let's pretend we're a trackpad. Because the <laughs> Mac knows what to do with the trackpad, right? Versus yeah. on Windows, we can actually say like, oh, no, we're this is like a touch input. So we were also able to add full support for um, uh, pencil as well. So you can draw with that. And then 
later, uh, well, coming next year, it'll be in the early next year, we're going to bring AstroPad Studio also over to Windows. So we're going to have Luna and AstroPad Studio on the Windows. We've put a lot of the groundwork in of adding that stylus support. And uh, you can use some of that today in Luna. Very cool. And I'm curious about audio. Is that something supported? Could you be playing a video in Luna Display in headless mode in a different room and use the iPad speakers to transmit that audio and have video sync up properly? Oh, I really, really wish we could. Yeah. Um, There's not an API on the Mac to do it. We haven't looked at it on Windows, um, but on the Mac, there is not. So I know there's some third parties that do it, but they'll do it through things like kernel extensions. It's a really complicated solution to try to solve. Yeah, and there's just not a good way to do that right now. Okay. Um, Yeah, that'd be amazing. That'd be amazing if we could. Um, so the solution now would be your, you have AirPods Max and the range on those things is incredible. And, uh, you yeah, just un- Mac. unfortunately, that's the best I could. Uh, now, perhaps there's something we could do with the hardware where we send the audio to the hardware, but we haven't. Yeah, you need that. almost a second dongle for the uh, the headphone jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I think we could do it through or HDMI. Uh, I guess does both, and I guess yeah, that's HDMI, USB-C. And USB-C. Yeah, yeah, USB C. I don't know if we'd have to have full Thunder. I think we could probably do it through USB C. But anyway, it's a pretty complicated problem to solve. Right. Um, it'd be awesome if there was an API available, and it's one of those things that Apple does because they can do it for Apple TV, example for example. But again, mm-hmm. that's their own private sauce that they don't. Yeah. Uh, give to third parties. Right. But that'd yeah. be cool. We definitely get that request. I would like it myself. Yeah. For the headless mode, you can do that wireless or wired as the other kind of setups. Mm-hmm. Um, so with, with wired mode, with like an iPad Pro, you just hook in a USB-C to C cable up and that'll get the job done. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yeah. And for the headless, that's really, really have those people doing it with, with Mac mini where they're plugging in a Luna into their Mac mini to be able to access it around their home via their iPad. Yeah. That seems like a really... Solid things. Those things are so tiny. You just throw it in a closet, and there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, what have been some of the cooler kind of setups you've seen for Luna Display? How how are people using it? Yeah, in terms of setups, um, some of the that stick out to me is just the number of monitors some people have. <laughs> like they'll have. Yeah. Do some like people Mac- have like sidecar running and then Luna for a different iPad? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I've seen it. Yes. Um, because we can't, Sidecar can't do more than one iPad. We also can't do more than one iPad. Right. But if you run si- Sidecar and Luna at the same time, you can do two iPads. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but right. you can do it. Um, we've seen people do that. That's a pretty w- wild setup. Uh, just the number of screens, too, where I've seen just, you know, f- five plus screens, and then they've they've got an iPad as well, which is... You know, pretty wild. The other yeah. one I've seen that's pretty interesting is people using it almost like a control deck mm. where they'll, they're using their Mac and they have a keyboard and mouse, but then they also have the iPad there and some controls on their on their iPad. So it's almost like another input device for them okay. right there. Yeah. So they're not, and they're just using it as touch. So that's pretty cool. I've seen, I haven't seen that a lot, but, um, and there was one other, I was going to mention that, um, it, it'll come back to me. I'm yeah. blanking on what it was right now, but there was another, uh, another pretty cool setup. A lot of people are super creative with what they come up with. I'm not sure if this would be something in demand right now with how external display support is on the iPad. Um, it's pretty rudimentary, but if you guys experimented with, uh, plugging a Luna display in, into an iPad and using a different iPad as like say in LumaFusion previewing a video while you're editing. Yeah, I um did play around with the external screen uh, support in the iPad, iPad OS specifically for that yeah. reason. Um because I was like is there something we could is there something here? Uh and yeah, it's it is rather limited. I don't think there's probably a ton of people using it right now. And on top of it for us it would be a pretty significant hardware revision okay yeah i wasn't sure how uh the app yeah. would need to write to be able to program the luna stick to be able to do that yeah so that's the thing is on the mac we're able to offload some of it into software but to run on like in the I- ipad like you're discussing because yeah. of ipad os we can't run like background stuff that's right. at the same system level as the mac we really need everything to work within luna itself and so that requires some pretty significant changes to the hardware that it'd be a lot of work. It'd be super cool, but I'm just yeah. not sure there's enough people out there right now. Yeah, maybe one day to, once uh, Apple themselves improve the external display uh, app. 
put uh, yeah yeah that could be that could be cool because then at that point you could use it for more than just the ipad as well we could use it with a lot of other devices but it's yeah. just it's a really really significant hardware development uh problem yeah that makes sense for us um when you do have like a magic keyboard uh, hooked up to the ipad with the trackpad and keyboard um is that a pretty seamless experience say you're in headless mode and will, will everything work um as you'd expect it to there well, almost. And I can thankfully say that in a couple weeks, we'll have that fixed. Um, we didn't have complete trackpad support. And uh, our our next uh, next update that's going to be coming out, I don't want to promise a date right now because yeah. we're still in QA and getting it. We'll f- uh, fix that and add complete support. So then it will be really seamless. Cool. And then uh, something I'm curious about. Uh, this is another kind of like out there thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, say you hook... Um, an SD card up to your iPad or say you hook up a MIDI keyboard over USB to your iPad. What's the chances that you could have accessories or hard drives hooked up to an iPad and then the Mac itself that you're working on sees it. So you're in finale from the Mac and you're able to, you know, in a different room be hooked up, um, to that MIDI keyboard on your iPad and be working. Oh, that would be super cool. But we don't have the level of access we would need on the iPad to be able to do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's pretty deep down within the system. We have actually had people ask to do that with uh, another Mac. Like, could I have another Mac and access their accessories? We don't do that right now. Um, and I don't know what would be involved in um, in doing that. So it's not something we could we could do today, and definitely not on uh, iPad OS. Um, I mean, that's that's part of the part of my love and hate with uh, iPad OS as well. Is it is really locked down and nice and streamlined, but it is hard to really, really customize yeah. with third party stuff. It's just, and even on the Mac, less and less of that is available as they lock it down. Yeah, Often for security, are getting progressively yep. harder to do. Absolutely. Uh, and the, the APIs that are available to do that, the, the surfaces of them are becoming smaller and smaller, which I understand their reasons for doing it too. Like, they've had security issues, they've had stability issues with people not you know putting together pretty crappy kernel extensions right yeah. and all of a sudden you have a, a max is crashing all the time so i understand i understand the reason for doing it but it does make some of these pretty uh pretty wild and fun ideas that apple may never do themselves impossible for a third party to do which yeah. is which is a bummer yeah yeah and I imagine the bandwidth uh to do that kind of transmission might be a bit tricky as well to to transmit so. that's the other thing that could be depending on what it is it especially if it was something that needed a lot of bandwidth that yeah. could be it could be an issue definitely right uh speaking of bandwidth um promotion uh that tech is now on macbook pros in a limited kind of way for now it was software still rolling out um it's promotion is that kind of frame rate able to be transmitted hypothetically in the future for luna to an ipad it's uh something we need to look at uh I'm I'm definitely curious about it. We need to play around with it. Um, I got a um, one of the new MacBook Pros to play around with that myself. Actually, yeah. Previously, we didn't do even so. Even when the iPad was able to do promotion, we didn't do it in Luna because often the Macs weren't capable of driving it at the time. Like right. the GPUs yeah. just weren't. You know. Yes, uh, there would be some Macs out there, but the vast majority of people were going to have these Intel integrated GPUs that just aren't that great. Um, but that's changing now with the M1 right. and the awesome GPU support in there. So we do want to play around with it and see if, I don't know for sure today if we can do it, but it's definitely something we want to take a look at. Because yeah. these GPUs are just so powerful now right? Um, that it, it might be... Um, it might be something that for data transmission reasons might need to be wired Mm -hmm. or maybe we can't do it at retina resolution. Like maybe we need to do a lower resolution if we're wireless just because of the huge amount of data. Um, But at least we can consider that now because the GPUs are finally powerful enough to be able to really, really do that. Yeah. Or maybe at stage one, you support uh, the promotion that uh, doesn't ramp up the 120, but actually ramps down to, to save on battery and stuff. Yeah, it's um, yeah, we were just, just previously just so limited because uh, a bunch of the computation that that happens on the Mac side of things is actually done on the GPU. Part mm-hmm. of our tech stack runs on the GPU, and so 
that needed to be be able to run fast enough to be able to hit that because at at 60 hertz you have 16 milliseconds per frame at 120 then you have eight milliseconds per frame and on many Macs, that just wasn't enough time to get done the work that we'd need to get done. But now with these new beefy M1s, uh, like the M1 Max <laughs> in particular, uh, it, they're pretty insanely powerful. So it'll be cool to see what we can do with them. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the last things I'm curious about, teleprompter mode. Uh, how did this come about and how were, how do you kind of set this up and take advantage of this? It kind of came together serendipitously which um if you know sandwich videos uh and adam lissagor yeah who runs sandwich videos even if you don't know he is it you know somebody listening to this probably seen him he's uh did like the early square commercials the yeah. early square he helps shows, out the with the, um, the talk show live at wdc i believe yes right? yeah Yep, totally. Yeah. So he's done tons of really great stuff. And he's a big, big fan of um, uh, Luna Display and Astropad. And he'd been using Luna Display. And he had this, because he had access to all sorts of um, cool camera gear, he had been using his iPad with a teleprompter with Luna Display. So he was using Luna Display and he was putting it in the teleprompter. But it was driving him crazy that the image was reversed through the teleprompter. Mm -hmm. And... um, so he emailed us and was like, Hey, is there any way to like flip the display? And we're like, yeah, like we could do that. But like, is anybody going to use this? So we went back and forth and eventually agreed. Like, he's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to make a video about this. If you guys do this. And so we built in the feature. He made a video, which is awesome. Showing off Linux display in the teleprompter mode and using it with his teleprompter setup, which is super cool. <laughs> And um, we've been honestly surprised at how popular it's been. Yeah. Uh, since COVID, a lot more people have gone out and gotten teleprompters and they put a screen or an iPad in it. Mm-hmm. And then if you put an iPad in it, Luna's great for that because you can turn on teleprompter mode. And it Because the thing is, is, it's like without Luna's teleprompter mode, if you put an iPad in there, <laughs> it's um, flipped. It's like yeah. looking at a mirror. Everything's backwards. Right. So we correct, we flip the screen to correct that. And it makes it way more, way more usable. It's super cool, especially if you're on a video call and you want to have like direct eye contact. Mm. Um, you want to be looking at the person. That's why he uses it. Oh. You want to be looking directly at the person. And so he'll put his Zoom video call right onto Luna that's in his teleprompter. Yeah. And um, so in order to, to do this, you really need Luna and you need one of these, these teleprompters teleprompter you can get them on amazon all over the place too that has um and then you also need a camera to put behind the teleprompter as well um so it's not the easiest thing to set up and that's actually why i'm surprised there's so many people doing it and it's so popular in fact we're bringing it to the pc as well so pc users of lunar soon are going to have teleprompter mode as well because it's been it's been a big request <laughs> that's super cool uh how do you personally use astropad and luna display well for myself i definitely use luna display more lately i've been using the uh mac to mac mode we have in luna display yeah uh i've got a one of the new imacs on my desk mm-hmm. and i've been using it as an external display with luna so that's how i've been using it the most recently nice um and that was also because i wanted to qa some stuff so i've been using it like that it was actually it's actually been really really nice to do that to, since there's no target display mode anymore, target yeah, and Apple won't sell anymore. a consumer monitor anymore. Yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. So uh, I've got this beautiful uh, iMac here, and it works as a great monitor. Otherwise, um, I tend to use Luna Display on the go. Um, so often I'll work from my home office, but sometimes I'll work from the patio in the backyard. I'll go to a co-working, go to a coffee shop. That's usually when I bring Luna with me because I like having multiple displays. I like having the screen real estate. So I use Luna a lot. Astropad I don't use as much since I'm not a professional artist and not a very good artist at that. But uh, definitely pull it out for annotation stuff. I, I like to use that for uh, for annotations, which for me it's often easier just to pull something into Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I work so much on the Mac anyway. So I'll just put something in Photoshop, launch Astropad Studio, and then just draw right over the top whatever I whatever I want to to put on there. And for me, that's a faster workflow than say transferring it to the iPad to a different app. Right. Which is also you're already in the do. Mac environment working and yeah, I'm already I'm yeah. already right there. Then I'm just like copy paste from Photoshop right into Slack. Boom, done. Yeah. Right. It's just really seamless for me. So that's how I personally uh use use Astropad. 
Um, but I would say of the two, I definitely use Luna more. Very cool. And um, anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to before we wrap it up? Well, love to love to hear what people think about Astropad and Luna. Be sure to be sure to check them out as well. You can find them at uh, astropad.com is where uh, where we we have them available and um, PC support coming for both next year. PC support available today for Luna Display, so you can use your your iPad or uh, another Mac with your PC which is pretty trippy. I've got some pictures here of this new I, blue iMac with uh, Windows 11 on it from my PC nearby as a display for my PC, which is pretty trippy, but it's cool. Um, so uh, so check that out. And uh, yeah, love to love to get people's feedback and hear what they have to have to say about Astro Pen Lunar. Very cool. And your, your Mac support goes back pretty far. I was very sad to see that I'm like right at the cutoff. I have an 11 inch uh, 2011 MacBook Air that cuts off at high Sierra. So I'm like just a year before the cutoff, <laughs> which means. Yeah, me. you know, we didn't even want to have to do that, actually. We actually supported more before, but uh, M1, we couldn't build for m1 have a universal binary and support some of the older os yeah so that's actually what forced us to cut it out gotcha. before that i think we went all the way back to mavericks oh wow but uh but yeah uh with things you know with the m1 now we've we've had to we've had to reduce our reduce our support but we try to we try to keep it pretty extensive yeah i think 2012 uh for most or even some 2011 max if they were higher end um so yeah it's still a good 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 wide range there yeah, same with the iPads as well, where we now, um, well, we support any device that supports iOS 12.1 or later. But for a long time, we supported 32-bit, all the yeah. old 32-bit stuff. But we had to, <laughs> as well, as, as Apple was no yep. longer supporting it, we had to no longer. And we've been able to support a lot of these older devices because we first built AstroPad so long ago. Right. We first built it, started in 2013, and we were hyper-obsessed with performance when we built it. Yeah. And so it ran really well on the 2013 <laughs> Mac. So that's why we could keep supporting a lot of this old stuff. It's just yeah. as as the OSs move on and Apple doesn't support them, we we kind of have to move with it. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so what's the website to, to learn more? Yeah, definitely check out astropad.com. Um, and if you uh, want to find out more about me, uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, M-R-O-N-G-E or uh, at my website, M-R-O-N-G-E dot com. I uh, like to document a lot of the stuff that's happening at AstroPad as well, the kind of the ups and downs and, and our journey uh, bootstrapping that I that I share on Twitter. Very cool. And you guys have a podcast, I believe, as well. We do. We do. That's right. We do. We have a podcast called Building AstroPad. And that's really behind the scenes look. I think of it kind of like a director's commentary on what's going on. Uh, so we share, again, a lot of the, in more detail, a lot of the things I share on Twitter as well, the ups and downs of bootstrapping and building a uh, tech company that does software and hardware and um, what that experience has been like. And our marketing, we, we dive in all sorts of things, marketing, engineering, product development, uh, you name it. So uh, check it out if you're interested in more of the kind of behind the scenes of how we make the products. Very cool. Well, thanks, Matt, for your time. This has been a great chat. been really looking forward to this. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, having me on. It's been great. Well, that's my interview with Matt all about AstroPad. If you are someone that does use a Mac as a part of your workflow, check out astropad.com for more information. My thanks again to Matt for his time recording. And my thanks to you for your time and attention tuning in. As a reminder, you can support the podcast financially over at patreon.com slash iPadPros or by being a paid subscriber to the podcast in Apple Podcasts. My thanks to everyone that currently or has in the past supported the show at either of those places. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. With that, I'll talk to everyone again real soon.